Stoicism helps you to conserve and best deploy your limited resources. It's out of your control, trying to allocate as few calories, as few minutes, as few dollars to that as humanly possible. You know, all this is your fault, right? <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. so so i had this crazy idea samantha and i had this crazy idea to do this bookstore thing uh -huh. and you know when you have you have a crazy idea most people are like oh yeah that sounds great you should blow up your life to become a yoga teacher or whatever you know like <laughs> sure. it sounds amazing <laughs> and so i was like i felt like everyone was telling me what i wanted to hear mm -hmm. and so i was like you know what i'm gonna call tim tim will tell me if this is a terrible idea or not mm -hmm. because you always do and and also i felt like what you really want in those situations, you want disconfirmation, not confirmation. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, Tim will tell me not to do this. And then I probably won't do it because I felt like you of all people would be like, you know, you're, I, I take your philosophy to largely, not largely, but a big part of it is like, how do you understand the life you want? How do you avoid unnecessary entanglements, obligations, mm -hmm. overhead, you know, the things that sound fun on paper, but actually turn out you like, you just bought yourself a prison cell, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to ask him and he's going to tell me probably not to do it. And for a bunch of smart reasons. Anyways, I call you and you're like, I think it sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and you're like, but only if you think about it like this. Mm -hmm. And what you said is don't see yourself as opening a bookstore forever. See yourself as doing a two year experiment running a bookstore. Mm -hmm. So decide, you know, obviously that would sort of change how you would do some of the stuff. But your point was, think about it as an experiment. And, and you said, you'll only know if you want to run a bookstore. How You said, how else will you find out if you really want to run a bookstore than by opening a bookstore? Mm -hmm. And so you gave me permission to do it in a way that I could actually trust and that I didn't feel like you were, you know... Uh, fluffing yeah your passion <laughs> yeah exactly that's exa exactly exactly <laughs> what the it name is of my new podcast yeah, by the and, way and then we're i think this is the three-year mark but at the two-year mark it was like hey we actually do really enjoy doing it mm -hmm. we can settle into it a little bit more now and and it's a, it, i think just the idea of seeing doing crazy thing as an experiment or as an iterative process mm -hmm. as opposed to this is permanently my identity you know i can never go back mm -hmm. and then being either intimidated by it and not doing it or being locked into it forever if it's not working. Totally. And if I remember correctly, and I could be manufacturing this, but I get a lot of these calls, as you might imagine. <laughs> and there are people I call with my own situations sure. where I'm like, am I stupid? Yeah. Tell me, actually, I'm going to force you. What are the five ways if you had to steel man it that this is a terrible decision? Yes. Like, just take that side of the debate table. Mm -hmm. But I believe that also when we chatted, I said, all right, let's look at the fixed costs. Like, what are yes. the actual investment sort of capital outlays we're talking about and if it doesn't work can you hit undo like what are the costs like what's the carrying cost sure and i'm making this up right these are not real numbers but if we land at well worst case scenario i, I think i'll be 50 to 75k in the red after all is said and done if i hit undo and have to sell everything yeah. after three years i'm like okay well would you pay 20 x thousand dollars a year to know once and for all if this is something you enjoy doing and sure. then you're like oh okay that's actually from a life tuition perspective something you can wrap your head around and then you can think about opportunity cost or the cost of taking advantage of an experiment like this you think that life tuition experiments that's how you think about it because i remember when you decided to be an angel investor, mm -hmm. you looked at the cost of going to business school mm -hmm. and you said, okay, it's $200,000. Why don't I just spend $200,000 investing in companies? And I'll end up at the same place, which is I'll know how to invest in things. And with one, I'll have a degree <laughs> and a piece of paper. And the other, I might have valuable stakes mm -hmm. in a bunch of companies. Or if it fails in both cases, I'll have just $200,000 that I lit on fire, but I'll have learned something either way. Yeah, I'll have learned something. I look at it and this is not unique to me. This is something that Mark Andreessen has talked about. This is something, although he, every once in a while just deletes everything he's ever written. So I'm not <laughs> sure what the current status of that is. And Scott Adams has certainly spoken and written about this. He has an entire book, I think, dedicated to effectively, I can't recall the title, but how to win even if you lose. Mm 
how to fail bigly, perhaps. And the general heuristic is choosing projects based on the skills you will develop and the relationships you will develop, whether those are new or pre-existing, yeah. such that even if you don't get the outcome, public or private, that would be the objective marker of success, let's say in the case of investing, making more than you put in, in the case of a bookstore, maybe you could say, all right, if you're trying to compare 100 bookstores, you would yeah, look at sure. annual sales and this and that and revenue per employee, blah, blah, blah. Outside of that, though, what are some of the more abstract or less common line items that you could think about? Those could be skills. Those could be also skills that transfer, relationships sure. that transfer to other areas, right? So if I look at my collaborations that I've done in various projects, like for our chef, which was from an objective perspective, we look at the bestseller lists, a failure compared to my other books. Yes. But it led directly to the podcast. Yeah. And for that reason, it has been my most profitable book by far. If we look at that as an antecedent to the podcast. Right. By far. Yeah. And you can't or at least you shouldn't, I shouldn't evaluate the podcast in isolation because the prerequisite was the ex the set of experiences and the launch, which relied heavily on this new thing, relatively speaking, called podcasts. Yes. So that's how I think about it. And it, it takes a lot of also unnecessary stress or pressure out of the situation. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny though, because now it, the advice was very helpful and it feels like it worked out. But for the first year, it seemed like the worst idea in the entire world because uh -huh. this we were talking in maybe January of 2020. <laughs> and so we got serious about it. You yeah. know, like we started the construction the first week of March 2020. Right, right. So for, for the first year, <laughs> it wasn't even a bookstore. It was just an enormous albatross around my neck, an empty building filled yeah. with books. Yeah. You know, it was it was a series of bills that I was paying, but it was there was no there was no nothing coming back the other direction. But I remember I wrote this little note card to myself. Sort of speaking of stoicism, I said, "This is a test. Will it make you a better person or a worse person?" Uh -huh. Right, and so. The idea was, yeah, maybe this turns out to be an experiment that goes poorly uh, from a business perspective, but how did I grow as a result of it? Mm -hmm. What did I learn, right? Did I learn to not do crazy things? Did I learn actually to do crazy, that I can do crazy things, that I can absorb failures, you know, like- Reframe you, you, crazy things by totally. looking at them from a different perspective. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Uh, you know, what, what, do you, what do you take from it so you can win either way? Right. And the perspective shifting is really important. I mean, this is also I'm looking at this bust right behind you. and Of Marcus, yes. Yeah, reframing mm -hmm. and thinking about labels very carefully, thinking about expectations very carefully, which tie into language is super important. So in the case of, say, angel investing, almost anything you would ever read or hear about angel investing states something that is at face value very obvious, and that is high risk, mm -hmm. super high risk. Even if you're successful, 80% of them the investments will go to zero, yeah. yada, yada, yada. But the way that I folded the angel investing into a meta level plan to develop relationships and learn skills was not risky. Yes. At all. You were going to get that whether the company was hugely successful or hugely unsuccessful. And in fact, you may get those things more on an investment that didn't work yeah. than one that did work. Totally. And... That certainly ended up being the case. I, not to, which is not to say they all they're called experiments, not guarantees, for yes. a reason. Yeah, <laughs> there are there are plenty that don't turn out the way that I would like them to turn out. But as long as I hold it lightly as an experiment and not Tim Ferriss's final exam for his self worth, <laughs> yes, then you can roll with the punches, and it's not always easy. Well, like when a scientist has an hypothesis and then they do uh, an experiment, and then the hypothesis turns out to be wrong. They're not like angry and they're like, you're such an idiot. Why did you think that? The whole point of the hypothesis was that it might be wrong. Mm -hmm. And the point of the experiment was to find out if it was right or wrong, mm -hmm. not whether you're uh, a genius or an idiot. Yes, and there are human elements in science, of course, mm -hmm. and people have confirmation bias yeah. and there's a positive publication bias and there are all these things and plenty of politics. Uh, <laughs> you know, Henry Kissinger, RIP, right? Said he left academics because he couldn't take the politics yeah. at one point. 
So there was all of that, but the good, really good scientists, including, man, a lot of people have passed in the last year, Roland Griffiths, who I knew really well out of Hopkins, would say, that's a hypothesis worth disproving. I mean, that's the oh. wording that you would sometimes hear. Right. I like so that. So looking for disconfirming evidence. Yeah. Right. right. To counterbalance the very human inclination to look for what you want to see. Well, you mentioned uh, Mark Andreessen. Sometimes he tweets like, huge, if true. <laughs> you know, like he'll take something and be like, that's interesting if it's true. And the idea of like that. So what? that's another way of saying uh, that's a hypothesis worth disproving or proving mm -hmm. one way or the other. Yeah, totally. I agree. Yeah. It's uh, th your point though about like, okay, so you're going to do this thing. How do you mitigate or minimize risk or, or just how do you define what those risks are? To me, that's the essence of stoicism. It's also what you've called fear setting because sometimes like you think, okay, I, I want to do this thing. And then you're like, it could work. It could not work. It's high risk. Low, you know, it's a high risk thing potentially. But actually, it, it might be high risk of success or failure. But um, what is the actual downside? And sometimes mm -hmm. something could be high risk, but the downside could be very low, mm -hmm. right? So like, like yeah. oftentimes in our head, we exaggerate the downsides of things, right? Like I remember when I dropped out of college, obviously upside's high uh, if, the, if it worked out. The downside I thought was I could end up living under a bridge somewhere, but actually the downside was, and I discovered this when I went to fill out the paperwork to drop out. You end out. up owning a bookstore. <laughs> no, the, da the downside was like, she was like, yeah, just come back. Like, yeah, you're exactly. just pausing your, like, yeah. so in my head, I was making up that I was making this irrevocable life altering decision. Mm -hmm. And my, that's certainly what my parents thought. And that's certainly probably what most people think. But in fact, it was like a piece of administrative paperwork. And I found it, I found it the other day. It was $60. I, it was, I have the receipt. It was $60 to effectively pause, you know, my enrollment at college mm -hmm. of which I had 10 years to re-enroll. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and so what fear setting is, and I think with the stoic, this is the stoics called this the discipline of perception. It's this practice of going, yeah, I'm intimidated by it. I'm scared of it. I don't want to fail, but if I actually did fail, what's going to happen? And you, I think you, you very regularly find not much of anything that's going to happen. It's not as bad as you think it is. And in a lot of cases, it's reversible in the yes. case of, you know, the $60 <laughs> prepayment for the optionality. And not to belabor the point, but the language you use matters a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you think about some of the commonly used language, right, this is a decision, like there's a, there's a fork in the road and yeah. you have to choose a fork implies that going backwards is gonna be very difficult. Mm. Whereas a lot of these things, at least the way that I try to view them, and I don't do it perfectly, is more like walking into a closet and choosing which sweater you wanna put on. Yes. You don't like it? Mm -hmm. Put it back on the rack. Right. Go back to the one you were wearing before. I mean, it, in a lot of cases, it's it's a it's a much more, uh, it's, a, it's a much more appropriate way to view things. And that is like a pause or it's just really a temporary experiment that you can you can zig and zag with. Yeah, the, the language, you're right, is very important and and it can cut both directions. So yeah, we say I'm dropping out of college versus I'm taking a semester off. Or yeah, we say I'm quitting my job or one of the phrases you have in the four hour work week, a mini retirement. Mm -hmm. Like one feels empowering and the other feels uh, dangerous or irresponsible. And so the language, like, so when I called you and I said, hey, I'm thinking about doing this bookstore and you said, oh, that's a cool experiment. That was just a totally different way, phrase for what I was considering doing. All of the language I was using felt so permanent, so mm -hmm. life altering, so, you know, enormous. And what you yeah. did with your, you shrunk it down to this small decision. And like you're saying, someone going in their closet and they're picking out clothes. That feel that's an ordinary metaphor versus you know shoot for the moon or something like some yeah, you yeah, know yeah. like are you thinking big are you thinking big or are you thinking small and sometimes you want to think big sometimes you want to think small but just that the the way you're looking at it the words you're using determines like how large it's going to loom totally over you and also I re I recently reread and it's it's a little schlocky because it was written a long time ago but I still find it helpful there's a book by Dale Carnegie who a lot of people know for uh, how to win friends and influence people, mm -hmm. I believe it was. And 
he has a lesser known book that has still sold millions of copies called How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, oh. which includes a lot of stoic-ish tenets. Mm -hmm. And is very it's a very fun read because there are many, many different case studies and historical references. A lot of them are out of date. When he talks about neuroscience, don't pay a lot of attention. <laughs> However, the the general principles and examples are really helpful. And he talks a lot about incomplete information like, and improving your sort of visibility into a given situation by adding more information and that it is somewhat pointless if you can easily add that information to worry about it beforehand. Yeah. And the reason I bring that up is that in a case like opening a bookstore, right? Open a bookstore is this big kind of macro yeah. abstracted decision. In reality, it's a whole lot of different decisions. Little ones. Little ones. Yes. Such as looking into the actual costs, yeah. looking at what's available, looking at the current, let's just call it borrowing rates, yeah. et cetera. And so you could say, yes, I'm going to pursue this experiment, but only the next X steps. Like I'm not committing to three years, yeah. but I am committing to gathering more information so I can determine if I want to take the sort of yes. 10 steps after those preliminary steps. So I'll, I'll do that a lot as well, where it's like, okay, do I want to write a next book? Well, how would I decide what, what types of mini decisions could I make? What types of information could I gather that would help me to have a higher degree of conviction around whether I want to do it or not? Okay, let's take a week and do that first. Look at the landscape, talk to agent or agents, talk to authors, Look at A, B, C, D, and E. I mean, of course, look at subject matter and yeah. so on. And then you have much better footing for considering if you want to keep pushing forward. But breaking these big, heavy-sounding macro decisions into smaller steps also, I think, highlights the fact that it's not uh, you're not firing a gun, right? Like yeah. if you get to C, and then you want to stop and not continue to D, you very often have the ability to do that. When I wrote The Daily Stoic eight years ago, I had this crazy idea that I would just keep it going. The book was 366 meditations, but I'd write one more every single day and I'd give it away for free as an email. I thought maybe a few people would sign up. Couldn't have even comprehended a future in which three quarters of a million people would get this email every single day and would for almost a decade. If you want to get the email, if you want to be part of a community that is the largest group of Stoics ever assembled in human history, I'd love for you to join us. You can sign up and get the email totally for free. No spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want at dailystoic.com slash email. Yeah, it, it's, um, I remember when you, when I was talking to you about starting a podcast, you gave me advice similarly. You were like, don't do a podcast, do six episodes of a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Do, and, and if you think about it, it's like, don't open a restaurant, open a pop up, right? Like, so of course, there are, there's a reason that the economic incentives and life wants you to make big permanent commitments. It's, mm -hmm. it's usually cheaper, like, you know what I mean? Like to go, uh, they want to lock you in for a long period of time, they want you to be more invested. And you have to understand that what you're purchasing is a certain amount of optionality by mm -hmm. by not fully committing. And so, yeah. so going, hey, I'm going to do six episodes. That can feel harder in some ways, but it's easier in the, in that it allows you to just do the thing, not overthink it, get started on it, and then hopefully the feedback either gives you momentum in one direction or the other mm -hmm. about what you should or shouldn't do. What it also does is it gives you a graceful exit. So when yes. people ask me about podcasts. This is true for a lot of things. I'm like, limited time only. That is the key mm. phrasing or at least concept that you put forth so that you don't succumb to the very <laughs> kind of chimpanzee politics inclinations that we all have. I'm going to be embarrassed. It's going to look like a failure. Yeah. I can't stop because of the following uh, types of perceptions. But if you just say up front, I'm doing a single season of a podcast, yeah. six episodes, 10 episodes. If it goes well and you extend it, everybody's happy versus saying, I'm going to have a podcast implying indefinite and yeah. then stopping after six or 10 yeah. episodes. Psychologically, it's much more difficult for the person in the driver's seat, in this case, you or me, to make that exit. And so to preserve the flexibility, 
I do that all the time. And the optionality is important. Now, in infinite optionality is a problem. Yeah, right? sure. And then you have decision fatigue and so on. But I was given a book at one point. I can't even remember the title. I can't remember anything about the book other than it was related to financial management. And the line I remembered from it, <laughs> because there was a section that talked about how people who have some degree of financial success spend like 10 to 20 years accumulating and then they realize, fuck, this is a mess. Yeah. I have so much clutter, so many obligations, so many ongoing uh, headaches that now I'm going to divest myself. And then they spend the next like 10 to 20 years trying to divest themselves of these things. And in that context, which applies in a lot of circumstances, even if you're not wealthy per se by top 1% kind of standards, rich enough to rent. Yeah. And I was like, huh. It was like rich enough to rent. And that means try it before you buy it, basically. Try it before you buy it, and which means you might try it indefinitely. Yeah. Try it without buying it in the sense that I love mountains and rivers. I spend a lot of time in the mountains all over the place. And the the advice that I received from a lot of friends who know me super well was, oh, you should buy a place. Yeah. And the fact of the matter was that the the handful of places I looked at. I felt very confident we're going to do well yeah. in the real estate market. I could be wrong. I could be right. So far, I've been right. And I don't I actually don't think the logic is that hard to follow. But when I looked at the costs, I'm like, okay, where have I underestimated costs? Energetic as well. Energetic, yeah. time cost, not just financial costs in the past because yeah. I do own some real estate. It's like, all right, well, you think about the closing cost and the monthly cost. It's very, this sounds stupid, but it's it's sometimes easy to forget like, oh, wait a second, HOA dues. Oh, wait a second, yeah. property taxes. Oh, wait a second. The sink broke it, and the downstairs flooded and now you have to replace it, yeah. Right, it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And if you have an exterior, it just gets, I mean, look, I'm talking to a guy with <laughs> Nigerian dwarf coats and a lot of property, so you get it. And when I looked at these locations, I very quickly realized I could rent the most absurd, opulent place for a few months a year, well beyond anything I would ever buy. Yeah, I could do that probably for a decade and I would not approach my first and second year costs of buying something. Right. Now, the sort of homeowner equity argument has some rationale to it, uh, but there are trade-offs. Yeah. It's not all upside. Yeah. And so for me to reduce psychic drag, I'm like, okay, First of all, you don't need to be an investor in all categories. Yeah. A good financial investor. And in fact, you can make money doing other things. You don't have to make money in everything you do. I would take it a step further, which is sometimes it makes sense to quote unquote lose money in a very consciously aware way in certain categories so that it frees up your mental and psychic bandwidth to make money in a category that's more aligned with your zone of genius. Yeah. Like real estate is not my zone of genius. You know, sure. you're talking to the guy whose first house he bought adjustable rate mortgage in 2007. Oops, <laughs> got my face ripped off. Yeah, immediately. And I have made a lot of mistakes in say like public markets. Yeah, like once you get fancy, fancy gets broken. Like as as soon as you try to get clever, at least in my case, I get I get swiftly kicked in the balls by the universe. This has happened over and over again. So I've I've also I've realized not only do I not need to make money in certain categories, but to uh, there can be, I can make nominal sacrifices financially yeah. in some areas that free up a bunch of energy and resources that I can allocate somewhere where it matters a lot more. So you said something to me one time in, in regards to that. You said something like, what do you do with your money? Yeah. Right. And I was like, what do you mean? You're, you're like, do you like buy speed boats or like, you know, what do you, you're like, what, what are your like expensive hobbies? Right. Yeah. And I was like, I don't really have any. And then you're like, okay, so make your career and business decisions accordingly. Right, you're, that you're, might have been related to the bookstore. No, no, this is well before. This I remember before I was that. in, I was walking around in New York City. I just started my, I think my first company. Your point was, your point was, if you don't need lots of money, yeah. don't optimize your life around earning lots of money, mm -hmm. right? Um, I guess what you're saying is like, if you don't need it, why are you trading? This is a very stoic idea. Why are you trading your most precious resource, which is your life, or in my case, my, my creative energy? Why are you trading that? to get a thing mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily need, mm -hmm. right? You weren't saying like money is not important. You were just saying, 
if money's not your number one priority, make sure that you're not doing things for which the statement is money is my most important priority. Yeah, right. Look at your calendar. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me what's important. Like, yeah. Take a look at your calendar. I'll, I'll tell you what's important to you. Well, I think um, I, what I like about this is okay. So oftentimes when people think about stoicism, they think about it as a philosophy that is resilient. It's about dealing with adversity. It's about dealing with difficulty. And it's true. I mean, Epictetus is a slave, right? Marx Aurelius lives in a plague. Um, the Stoics lived hard lives. But it's also a philosophy for success. I don't mean it's a philosophy that will make you successful. The idea is the Stoics are saying that, that everything is an opportunity to practice the Stoic virtues. And by that, they meant you get your arm cut off, you know, uh, a pandemic happens, you get thrown in prison on unjust charges. These are opportunities to practice Stoicism. But it's also a chance to practice Stoicism when you find yourself the emperor. It's a chance to practice Stoicism if the company that you invested in becomes worth billions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you become successful as an author or as a, whatever you do. Like, I think less explored because it's slightly less relatable. Most people are dealing with hard things. Philosophy is also, or Stoicism is also a philosophy designed to help you with abundance or success in life. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. How, how has Stoicism helped you at, I mean, you've, you've done very well. You've done lots of interesting things. You've been at the top of the author game, the podcast game. You've been a great investor. How, how do you, how do you think of Stoicism in that sense as something that helps you deal with what we would call champagne problems or too much of a good thing? You know, like Stoicism is also there. You see the YouTube thumbnail now, <laughs> Tim Ferriss on champagne problems. Uh, there, there are a few things that immediately come to mind. So the first is I do a lot of things that I know are perceived by many people to be high risk that I don't consider high risk at all because I've run through exercises and journaling and so on that lean very heavily on stoic practices yeah. and have come to the definitive conclusion that this is not holistically high risk. I see. In the long game. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. the the real world MBA where I traded yeah. Stanford Business School for the the crucible at least of angel it, investing. That's right. Yeah. The the in theory Tim Ferriss fund of angel investing that I deployed over two years. And yes, there was a risk. Even the expectation, it wasn't even just a risk. I expected that like tuition, that money would vanish. And I was like, okay. Let's assume the money vanishes. Yeah. How can I approach the angel investing in such a way that my skills and relationships developed over that period of time far exceed mm. what I am expecting to lose? Yeah. And so I pulled the trigger. Now, the timing was also yeah. incredibly lucky in retrospect. At the time, it wasn't obvious, but in retrospect... Uh, it was it was very lucky, but it, there was some there was also some deliberation around it in the sense that, and I think this is compatible with it might not be verbatim reflective of Stoic writings, yeah. but thinking about competition very carefully. Hmm. In other words, so this is very it, Seneca is not the only who has written about this, but in terms of competing with your peers and yes. Wanting, but keeping up wanting, with the Joneses. Keeping up with the Joneses. Oh, you want to wear a purple tunic, do yeah. you? Hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about that. You, you want... think you're a success. That person has more than you. So yeah, not... right. Right. You feel like you need to go to the banquets and yeah. you need to do this and you need to do that. When I find an area that is crowded or competitive, I look at that as an opportunity to find something that is very uncrowded. Oh, sure. So that has also helped me. For instance... I'm coming up on the 10th year of the podcast and podcasting has become incredibly competitive. Yeah. And there was a long time when I felt like I was category of one. And if I'm being honest with myself, that's no longer the case. There's yeah. some very, very good interviewers out there, yourself among them. <laughs> and the production quality has gone parabolic. Yeah. It is, it is going to be harder to build a business and to fight for successfully fight for attention sure. in this particular format. And I love doing my podcast. I'm going to continue yeah. doing it. However, because I would pay to have these conversations yeah. anyway, by and large, I'm taking a moment to say, all right, wait a second. 
when I did angel investing from say 2008 to 2015, it got crowded. I felt like it went from single deck blackjack where you could kind of count the cards to like, you know, five deck. And then the, the, the table stakes got a lot higher yeah. because the terms got weird. There's a lot of money coming in from places like China and sovereign wealth funds. And I was like, oh man, this is going to get very, now the risk is real for mm. me financially. Sure. So I stopped for a while. And I've done that over and over again, right? Stop the books for a while. And in this particular case, I'm like, all right, I may not find an answer, but it would be a mistake not to look for an answer. Like what's yeah. neglected? And that's not necessarily something new. For instance, I think text is neglected. Yes. I think writing is neglected. Yes. And text isn't dead. It's just not surfaced by the algorithms. It's right. just not favored yeah. at the moment. But... It's the uh, most perennial of the mediums. It's the most perennial and it's the hardest. So if I'm looking at differentiation and competitive advantage, you have this too, right? Yeah. You can write. Writing's hard. Yeah. Writing is very, very hard, at least for me. And for that reason, I'm like, all right, well, maybe it's just the return to basics in that sense. Maybe it's fitting something old into a new vehicle et cetera, et cetera. Let's come up with a lot of bad ideas to see if there's maybe one or two yeah. good ideas we can test. And so I, to come back to your question though, I, I think that that is a way of avoiding comparison with others that can lead directly to outperformance if we're talking about yeah. success in financial terms. But it's also, it's also very compatible with success on your own terms. Mm -hmm. Right, I think Kevin Kelly's a great example of this. Right, has really forged his own life. There are other yeah. people for sure, but he's very good at questioning basic assumptions. Yeah, that are common. Right, they're so common that it's 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 taken to be fact. But in most instances, you can kind of negotiate reality around a lot of these assumptions. I was thinking of other sort of success problems that stoicism helps with, like haters is probably one or people who don't well, like you or mm -hmm. negative attention on top yeah. of yeah i mean the more especially if you're if your version of success or what you're pursuing is going to make you more public yeah <laughs> you are going to have to deal with all sorts of things that at least at current you have not faced this magnitude yeah. of negative attention yes yeah. And I've seen people buckle under that if they don't have the toolkit. Uh, and the toolkit doesn't have to be sophisticated, by the way. Like rule number one, don't go looking for it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, all right, if you're going to like do shuffle sprints on top of like broken floorboards, you're going to stub your toe all the time. And then, yeah. it, I mean, I'll admire you if you have the best stub toe fix, but maybe you just shouldn't run across the floorboards yeah. <laughs> barefoot, <laughs> which is what a lot of folks do when they're kind of hunting for comments. But being human, ending up fixating on the one or two people who are awful. I remember one time you said something like, okay, so let's say how many people know who you are, right? Like the, the first part of your career as a creative person, or really any, even anything that relies on the public is you want lots of people to find out who you are. You, mm -hmm. Your first problem is a lack of awareness. Mm -hmm. And then you get the awareness. Now, a certain percentage of those people are not going to like you, or they're going to have had a bad experience, or you're going to trigger something. Or they're going to be nuts. Yeah, right. So so like, you know, Daily Stoic has, let's say, 3 million Instagram followers. So let's say 10% of those people are just not fans. Mm -hmm. That's hundreds of thousands of people yeah. who just plain don't, who know who you are, but don't like you. Whereas in normal life, you know, if 10% of the people you meet don't like you, those people could fit in a small SUV. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's not it's not that many people. But and, so as and, you and also like 20 years ago, they're not enabled with the ability to publicly <laughs> they can't reach all the other people. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And so so it, it's I think that's a very key. So Mark Cirillus has to come to terms with the fact that he's the emperor of Rome. Some people don't even like that there's an emperor. Mm -hmm. Some people don't like him for good reasons. Some people don't like him for bad reasons. But the point is, you're not going to please everyone. And in fact, part of the job is just putting up with the fact that a bunch of people hate you and having to come to ter having to come to terms with the fact that one it's outside your control you can't make everyone like you and two if you try to make those people who don't like you like you or you spend your time obsessing about them what you're doing is making yourself miserable and not servicing or serving the people and things that do like you that you are good at yeah, totally. I was wondering, I don't know if you know this, this is a 
pretty sort of arcane fact to ask for. But do you have any idea what the greater, not the Roman Empire, but the greater Rome area, let's just call it, just like you have the greater Austin yeah. area, what or or Rome Central. Do you yeah. have any idea what the population was around Marcus Aurelius's day? So the the empire I know because I looked it up for something is like fifty million people. So let's say Rome is ten percent of that, right? There's still millions of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, where, I don't where know I was going with that is like more people may dislike you, yes, and me individually, yeah, than hated Marcus Aurelius, sure, at his peak as the last of the great emperors of Rome. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> or, or, Which is kind of hilarious to think about. Or, or to think there's there's probably more Stoics now than have ever existed before in history, mm -hmm. right? There may be more there may be more people who know about Stoicism but don't like me specifically mm -hmm. than have ever been interested in Stoicism <laughs> ever, right? Like, we're, you yeah. know, it, the the numbers get really big really fast because that's what technology allows for when you live in a world of eight billion people. Technology allows you to reach lots and lots of people, mm -hmm. and it's not healthy or uh, realistic for humans to be subjected to that, but we are subjected to it, right? Like, so you think success is gonna be amazing and it, it is in a lot of ways, but it's subjecting you to a fundamentally unnatural, uh, really difficult thing, which is like, you have to wake up and deal with the weight of the fact that like lots of people like hate you, mm -hmm. like they hate you. And and if you don't have the sort of fortitude and the, and the uh, confidence to just sit with that and to not let it eat at you or make you swerve off what you think you're supposed to be doing, like you're going to get eaten alive. Yeah, you'll get eaten alive. And you'll eat yourself alive. You'll eat yourself alive. And I think yeah, stoicism and reflecting on applications of stoic-like thinking, right? Because I'm not a stoic fundamentalist. Sure, right? me neither. I, I'm not like, this is... yeah. This is the scripture. This is the end all be all. It's like, well, well, that, well let's like extend that. Isn't one. A, right, exactly. Right? So like, let's extend, let's expand. All right. What other ways could this type of thinking apply? And I think that extends to 80-20 principle, Richard Koch type stuff. I think it extends to, it's really about the number of people who get it, not the number of people who don't get it. So yep. Kevin Kelly, 1,000 true fans type mm -hmm. of thinking, blue ocean versus red ocean, yep. blue ocean strategy kind of stuff. These are all highly, highly compatible. And I would go further to say there are a lot of people who, at this point, they've probably heard the word stoic. Yeah. At least the in case. the modern sense. Yeah, lowercase. Yeah. But they're not familiar with the canon of stoicism. Yet, if you if you look at anyone who has thrived in what most people consider high-stress environments, they're going to walk the walk. I, yeah. I just, I, I think that there's such a selection bias. There's a surv survival bias towards anyone who indirectly or directly has put into practice these principles on a regular basis that if you look at, and you know, I, this is just, these are hypotheticals. I haven't asked yeah. these people, but like anyone from a Bob Iger to a hedge fund manager to and an exceptionally good athlete yeah. who has had longevity. If you were to sit them down and walk them through Marcus Aurelius and so on for the first time, they'd be like, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's how I live my life." Yes, yeah. You have you have to because look, the chief task in life, the Stokes would say, is like finding what's in your control and what's not in your control. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to shift depending on who you are and where you are in the world, right? Like uh, Epictetus. His understanding of what was in his control and what's not in control. It's going to be fundamentally different than Marcus Rios. They're living a generation apart. One's a slave. One's the most powerful man in the world. One has slightly more things that are in his control than the mm -hmm. other, but still fundamentally they're limited by gravity, mm -hmm. right? They're limited by uh, the weather. They're limited by mortality. You know, they're limited by the fact that most people don't care what they have to say or think, mm -hmm. you know, like the, 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 the unpredictable nature of human beings. Like, so, so yeah, it changes a little bit, but more things remain outside your control than in your control. And that mm -hmm. fundamentally dealing with stress, high performance, success, whatever, whatever you're dealing with is coming down to this ba really basic, almost so basic, it doesn't feel like it could be ancient philosophy, mm -hmm. but is, is like, hey, what part of this can I influence? And what part of this do I have to accept and just deal with? and find a way to adapt and get comfortable with. 
And I think stoicism, as I think about it, you're much more familiar, of course. <laughs> uh, you're, you are uh, very much uh, familiar with the canon and the figures and thinking and the latest sort of modern examples. But from my perspective, stoicism is good for survival and self-preservation for the same reason it's good for success. Yeah. However you might define that, but let's just say being an outlier in some type of performance, it is because stoicism, stoicism helps you to conserve and best deploy your limited resources. Yeah. So for instance, if you are, and <laughs> humans are humans, right? So yeah. you're going to slip, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, at least certainly I do. So it's a, lo a lot of this is work in progress, but if you are easily offended, you're a poor resource allocator. Yeah. And if you look at the most successful CEOs of all time in a book, interestingly enough, called The Outliers is one example. Like one of the key characteristics is they're very good capital allocators, but what that comes down to is limited resource allocators. Yeah. So time, energy, attention, capital in this case. I think that the tenets of stoicism help you to be a better resource allocator coming back to what you said by pausing a lot yeah. to say or think about what is in your control and what is out of your control. If it's out of your control, trying to allocate as few calories, as few minutes, as few <laughs> dollars to that as humanly possible. Yeah, And sometimes it's tricky. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes there are gray areas. And so you have to make your best fast decision with the information that you have. But I think that the the tools are the same. The tools are the same. And there are plenty of things I've folded into my own life that are, are I think, highly compatible with stoicism that you might not find in the pages of, of some of um, the classics. But it's a mistake to think about stoicism as a joyless toolkit for preventing pain and ensuring survival. There's yes. a lot more to it. Of course. Like it's a more flexible toolkit. Yeah. My wife's been saying that like the, the key skill in life, we're thinking about this with young kids, like the, she says the key skill in life is the ability to deal with frustration, yeah. right? Or that basically at the end of the day, it comes down to, can you regulate your emotions? Mm -hmm. And so whether you're dealing with a catastrophe or what Tennessee Williams calls the catastrophe of success, mm -hmm. right? Which is its own catastrophe. Like it basically comes down to emotional regulation. Can you regulate extreme elation? Can you regulate, can you, uh, regulate extreme despair? And can you figure out how not to be overwhelmed by the situation you're in, but figure out, okay, what am I going to do about it? What what am I being asked to do here? What's the best thing to do here? What's going to get me in more trouble? What's going to give you less? You know, you're, you're trying to figure out how do you, how do you integrate, address, respond, not be corrupted by, you know, whatever the moment that you're in. And that's mm -hmm. the same at and either end of the extremes. And you can, ex you can really extend the scope of regulation, at least I do, to think about a, a, no, a lot of different factors and also a, a, a compatible and I think complementary word, which is repair. Right? So yeah. I have a very hypervigilant system, right? From, we don't have to spend time on it, but had some awful things happen to me as a kid. And my, my, sympathetic nervous system goes into overdrive very easily. Yeah. And I have tried a million and one tools <laughs> for preventing this from happening. But the reality is that there are many instances in any given week. This week is actually a very good example. <laughs> actually texted a friend, can I curse on this podcast? Yeah. Where I was like, because <laughs> he knows what's going on. Yeah. And I was like, so I put in quotation marks. I was like, surprise, bitch. It's time for your surprise semester exam from the yeah. universe. Yeah. And I was like, okay, sure. You're doing all this meditation, reading all the stoicism. Yeah. Let's see what you got. Yeah. And this week was one of those weeks. And there are, there have been times when I'm like, my God, like my, my resting heart rate is at like 120. Yeah. And then it's about repair. And the tools are the same. The tools are very similar, right? Thinking about like sitting down, doing a little serenity prayer. <laughs> <laughs> And th also thinking about the worst case scenario, uh, testing assumptions, and 
the repair is incredibly important. And also thinking about not just what thoughts are you going to have, what questions are you going to ask, what exercises are you going to do in your head that will help in these moments, whether it's preventative or repair, but also thinking about the conditions that lend themselves to dysregulation. Too much caffeine, too little sleep, alcohol before bed. And a lot of the times, like you don't need to sit down. You're having a really rough day and you're like, wow, I need to figure out my life. Fuck, <laughs> what am I going to do when I grow up? I'm lost. And it's like, no, you have low blood sugar and you didn't sleep. Like you yeah. need some macadamia nuts and a cold shower yeah. and a nap. And don't you think uh, repair, one, taking care of yourself, so self-care, working through it. But this is something I definitely think the Stoics didn't talk about enough. And so I don't think the Stoics are, are flawless or perfect in any way. But it's also repair to the person you yelled at because you got upset. 100%. Or the person you were frustrated with because you were anxious or, you know, any, or the person you neglected because you were consumed by this thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like stoicism isn't never freaking out, never going into a downward spiral, never being overwhelmed by your emotions. It's hopefully catching yourself before you've done something terrible as a result of those things. And hopefully as you get better, ratcheting sooner and sooner how fast you can do it but it's what you do after you've done it right after you have the awareness to go okay i didn't live up to my standards here i did something i shouldn't have done i understand and empathize with the consequences that had on you mm -hmm. and i'm sorry <laughs> right mm -hmm. like that that the, the stoicism isn't just being this invulnerable disconnected hermit you know yeah autonomous being but you exist in society and you exist in relationships yeah and and that the repair isn't just to yourself but to those people too other other practices that uh i mean i i, I do sometimes i'll be honest skip some of the very esoteric uh a cosmological, like you don't, teleological. You don't care about the Stoic physics? <laughs> Not so much, generally. So I skip a lot of that, but there are a few things that I feel like I've indirectly taken from that that are uh, very much along the lines of some of the chapters in 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman, great which book. I think is a great book. Yeah. I really enjoyed this book. And there is a chapter, I think it's called cosmic insignificance therapy mm -hmm. but really zooming out and looking at your goals problems hang-ups neuroses in a broader and broader context of the world and yeah. history and the universe and this sounds very hand wavy but it ends up being very very therapeutic and i've had a number of people who i have interviewed who have arrived on their own to some type of similar exercise yeah people who are who have supervised thousands of deaths in hospice care memory champions uh, military leaders astronauts. astronauts who all do have done some version of this and the reason i bring that up is that it's another way to take the magnifying glass off of some of your issues yeah right like reflect on the problems like this week, five years ago, what were you worried about? Can't remember? Yeah, exactly. Right, 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 <laughs> right. right. Well, I, I was just thinking about this because so two different times in meditations, Mark Strauss talks about taking the view from above. Mm -hmm. He calls it Plato's view. And so I was thinking about that. I was like, well, <clears throat> how tall could you get in Rome? So Marcus Aurelius has this column. They erect this column as a monument to his victories. And it's like a hundred something meters tall. So like if Marcus could get to the top of this column, which we don't know if he did or not, that's like 300 feet. Mm -hmm. And I think the tallest mountain in Rome at that, not at that time, of all time, it's like <laughs> 15,000 feet or something like that. And he never climbed that. But the point is in Marcus's time, that's as high as you could physically get, mm -hmm. right? And now you could get that on a Southwest flight for $99, double that, right? You can get it 30,000 feet and look down at, you see enormous, you know, plots of land, states, you know, you all of a sudden you see it and, and you see how small it is. Mm -hmm. And the astronauts call this the overview effect. Mm -hmm. Like you think about humans did not see the earth. A human being did not see the earth from not on earth until like 1972, like mm -hmm. the blue marble photo yeah. and how, what a paradigm perspective shifting piece of information that was, mm -hmm. right? Like America is the most powerful country on earth at that time. We have nuclear weapons, all this stuff. And then you see us as just 
one of the the green continents on a on a little marble that's mostly ocean mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it shrinks way down to significant and you think about all the people who had all these problems in each individual pixel on that photo yeah and it shrunk down to that exact cosmic significance and the astronauts that have been there they talk they're like all you feel two things you feel total insignificance and you also feel complete and total interconnectedness mm -hmm. because all the borders and boundaries and distinctions that separate us as human beings go away when you get that big also mm -hmm. i really recommend people at least read this chapter you should read the whole book four thousand it's a great book the cosmic insignificance therapy if you search that in my name i i liked that chapter so much that i reached out to Oliver and got mm -hmm. an excerpt. So that yeah. chapter is available on my blog and people can read it. So I, I really do suggest that. Another thing came to mind, you can tell me if this is somewhere in the in the the Stoic, <laughs> in the Stoic writings. And this has come up a lot for me over the years and has come up very recently also, which is the belief that, and I'm borrowing here, this is definitely yeah. attributed to somebody else, but never let a good crisis go to waste. Yes. And really deeply believing, and this could be self-deception, but it's enabling self-deception. Mm -hmm. It's it's <laughs> very beneficial self-deception in, in a sense that if you're really experiencing a seismic shift of a problem or something that is, is, is a very non-trivial problem, to to look at that problem and to really sit down and ideally write out how the problem is based on your assumptions that you have about how things should work or yeah. how you should do things. And I think it's Dan Sullivan, who uh, I've never had any direct interactions with, but he runs something called, I think it's the Strategic Coach. And he talks about how the problem isn't the problem, it's how you view the problem yeah. that is the problem. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying it's not to... Our, it's not things that upset us, it's our opinion about things, the Stokes say. Yeah, exactly. And to to figure out, like, why is this a problem? Yeah. Is it because your five friends handle this problem in this way and they have established this as a priority because it is a problem for them? Is it something you should be doing in the first place? Yeah. Is there a way to remove this entire category of problem by stopping something, by hiring someone, by firing someone, et cetera? Yeah. And I'm doing a lot of that right now. Uh, it's it's a it's a good time for us to have this conversation because it's a good reminder for me on a lot of levels. And I'm having to pull out all the tools in the toolkit. <laughs> I, I gave a talk to Live Nation last week, and so I was like trying to think like what's like a music story I could tell. And um, so I, I told the story of of Taylor Swift. So like to, in 2019, Taylor Swift's masters are sold from her first five albums. Mm -hmm. They're actually bought by Scooter Braun. She's very upset by this. Scooter Braun reads the Daily Stoic, so I, I, I make no judgment. He's cool with me, but uh, she's her masters are sold, right? Yeah. And and she decides that this is a problem. She's very upset by it, right? And can't argue with the fact that she doesn't like it, right? Like you can say this is just a part of how the music business works, uh, and that he didn't do anything wrong, but she didn't like it, right? To her, it represented this kind of betrayal, um, and she was really pissed off that now somebody else controls the masters to her music. So she, at the funny enough, she she sees this tweet. Kelly Clarkson tweets about it, like two musicians helping each other, I guess. And she goes, "Why don't you just re-record all your masters and put out new art, right?" Which seems like a crazy idea. Like, mm -hmm. why would anyone do that? But that's what she did. She spent the whole pandemic re-recording every song plus a bunch of bonus songs and shooting new art for her first five albums, right? So when people think. Like Taylor Swift is now unequivocally the biggest artist in the world, maybe the biggest person. Also raises in the world. so many questions for me about the how you can even legally do that. Also, well, I, I know copyright is the expression. Yes, but there's I, a two tier. There's two kinds of intellectual property in music, which is interesting, which I don't fully understand either. But the point is, when when people see like the Eras tour, like which is not just the most successful concert tour in history, it's earned more than the first, the second, and third two tours have combined. Like even the the movie about the tour has made over a hundred million dollars, right? So it's the biggest thing in the history of music, probably the history of the entertainment business, uh, of a singular artist doing a singular thing. It's it's actually a result. You wanna talk about the obstacles of the way. It's a result of this 
seemingly terrible thing happening to her, right? So the thing happens to her, her masters are sold, but how she responds to it, what she, her decision not to waste it and to use it, to channel that energy into some yeah. productive end is what creates what's possible now, right? Because it, it seems like she's always been this big and she has always been big, but the process of re-releasing five consecutive albums plus two that she recorded, two or three that she recorded just of all new music during the pandemic makes her like this powerhouse in music because she's, it's like every day there's a new song. Yeah. Every month there's something new from her. So she's just been the recipient of just endless amounts of media attention. She's been rediscovered by a whole generation of people, right? And and then it sets up going on this tour where she says, I'm gonna play music from every era of my life, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was just, I, I think it's such an interesting example. Like when, you, when we say, Never let a crisis go to waste. Crisis isn't, you know, your whole family is murdered in front of you, right? Crisis is also just like something that you didn't want to happen happens to you. And then you are defined by what you do in response to that. And it can be a springboard for things that not only you didn't think were possible, but like nobody thought were possible. Mm -hmm. For Artists typically re-record their music and it's just this like kind of technical legal thing that manifests itself in the fan experience in basically no noticeable way. But the way she did it and the way she set it up set about this transformational, transcendent series of events that have made her what she is. And that all comes from this thing that if you had asked her in that moment, do you want this to happen to you? Mm -hmm. She would have said, not on my fucking life. Yeah, you know, totally. I would rather die than that happen. Yeah. And that's what we have the ability to do. And so I think when we think of stoicism as this philosophy of resilience and creativity and 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 it's it, it's she's a very privileged person when this happens to her she's already extremely successful it's not just for you at your lowest moment but you can you can transform things that happen to you into that if you want yeah i mean on a on a much smaller scale yeah. <laughs> i mean what everything what, is on a smaller what scale, be on a smaller yeah. scale? for our chef right that yeah. was, that was a book that completely burned me out yeah. I mean, I burned myself out. Sure. It was three, probably a three year, very complex book, very, very detailed, very involved. My first four color book, I decided it would be a great idea if I did like 40% of the photography myself, even though I'm not a photographer. Great idea. Also, just you wanted to learn a thing you didn't know how to do. Right. That was like, right. also just the, the, the content of the book itself, like the yeah. ideas was not easy. Yeah, I, I so this is this was a an incredibly difficult book. I'm very proud of how it was executed, but crammed something that should have been three or four years into a year, year and a half, and just flamed out. Yeah. And at the time, again, I would have said I absolutely would never have wanted this outcome. Yeah. But when you have an experience like that, or when Taylor has an experience like that, I can't speak for her, but I imagine. <laughs> yeah. What an experience like that does is it allows you it gives you permission to take time to step back yeah and to pause and to look at things with fresh eyes in a way that you often disallow yourself from doing if you are chugging along keeping the trains running on time yeah following your daily weekly routine whatever that might be and it doesn't always work out but in my case without that window also without that extreme fatigue, I would not have, I do not think I would have possibly experimented with the podcast. I I was just writing about this uh, kind of pine tree and I'm forgetting what it's called exactly, but I have a, one of the pine cones in my office as a reminder. But basically, so it's like any other pine tree, drops a pine cone, pine cone has the seeds in it, right? That's how the new trees come. But these pine cones, like, you know, if you ever see a pine cone that hasn't like done that yet, it's still like the green... It only unlocks when it is subjected to temperatures that weather alone cannot reach. Hmm. So it's only forest fires hmm. that allow it to do what it does. So the thing that is the worst thing in the world for the tree, mm -hmm. which is a fire, which burns down the forest, is also what allows a new stand of trees to come in its place, right? And so like, it's funny, I was, I was looking at the tree, I was like, this doesn't look burned. Like, how did it, how, how did she get it to open? I bought it on Etsy. Well, she puts them in a tray and then she puts it in the oven. <laughs> like yeah. she gets them, she puts them in the But the point is it only does what it does when subjected to extreme 
you might even say unnatural amounts of stress or adversity. Mm -hmm. And there is something that, to me, that's the essence of what Stoic philosophy is. Like Marcus Aurelius is a student of philosophy, then he becomes emperor. And then basically everything that can go wrong goes wrong for the next 20 consecutive years, right? There's the Antonine Plague, there's floods, there's uh, a coup attempt, there's war, right? He, he buries multiple children, right? Like it's like everything that can go wrong goes wrong. But that's when he becomes Marcus Aurelius. Like he would have been a, his predecessor, Antoninus, his, his model in all things. Basically nobody knows his name and nobody thinks about him at all because he got 20 years of peace and prosperity. Like everything that could go right goes right for him and he's basically forgettable. Everything goes wrong for Marcus and he becomes the person that you read about in the pages of meditations, right? And so it's this idea, I think, that you want things to go the way you think you want them to go. Mm -hmm. And then it's only when they don't go that way that you figure out what you're really capable of and you do the things that really you're only capable of in those moments. It makes me think, I haven't thought about this in a long time, but it was either Ann Murico, who's a very well-known investor, tech investor, or Mike Maples also. They work together, investor. I think it was one of the two, but apologies if I'm misattributing, guys, sure. which is something along the lines of sometimes you need life to save you from what you think you want. Yeah, exactly. And that has been, I think, a real key for me. Are those mints or nicotine? Hey, you want a um, caffeine oh. mint? Oh, caffeine mint? No, I'm good. <laughs> Not a sponsor, by the way. I'm just a different <laughs> uh, Yeah, you, you you think you want it to go a certain way, and of course it doesn't. I, I, I was just reading this story about Hemingway. So Hemingway is this aspiring novelist. He's uh, living with his wife in France. He's in Switzerland, and he's meeting with this famous journalist, and his wife, he, he like telegrams her to come meet him he wants to introduce her to her, but she basically, she takes, she's like, oh, he wants me to bring all his work to show off to this guy. So she gets everything he's ever written in his oh, life. God. She gathers I think it I see all, where this is going. She gathers it all up, <laughs> puts it in a briefcase, gets on a train, head toward, heads towards Switzerland. She's in a train station in like Lyons or something. And uh, she gets off to get like a coffee. She comes back to the train car. The briefcase is gone. Oh, God. Was it stolen? Did she lose it? Did she set it? We don't know, but it's gone. Everything he has ever written disappears. And Hemingway was, of course, devastated and feels like his whole life is ruined. I don't know how a marriage would possibly recover from this. It, it does not, right? But but um, he writes this letter a few weeks later to Ezra Pound and he goes, I know what you're going to tell me. He's like, you're going to tell me good, start over. But he's like, I'm not there yet, <laughs> you know? And I love that too, because it, it's easy to be flipping about this. Like yeah. Taylor Swift did not the next day yeah. after her master cell go, I'm going to re-record all my albums and it's going to transform me into the stratosphere, right? Like it's okay to feel sorry for yourself for a while. It's okay to fucking be pissed too. And I don't think there's, I don't, you look, you think about all the things Marcus Aurelius goes through. There's got to be days he does not get out of bed, right? He mm -hmm. must have been devastated and pissed off. But it's after you accept it, and then you get to work on it that you can turn it into that thing. And, and what happens is basically like a forest fire, all the underbrush for Hemingway is cleared out and he has to start over and he invents his new sort of writing style mm. as a result of basically in his mid twenties losing everything, right? And we, so it's in retrospect, we know this is what happens. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at any phase in your life where the worst thing that could happen to you happened to you, now you have integrated it in and you see how it helped you get where you're going. Yeah, by the way, with the podcast, like it wasn't obvious on day one. It wasn't even obvious on the anniversary of year one, probably not even year two. Yeah. Right? It, right. Was, it was not clear. And I also want to state for the record <laughs> that not all crises turn into these Willy Wonka golden tickets, right? Yes. A lot of them are just things that you need to weather. Yes. But... I've tried to cultivate the habit of at least looking for the possibility that there is an angle from which I can see something that I would miss if I were just singing the woe is me song. Well, it's like sometimes the disaster or the crisis presents an advan an opportunity to advance professionally or, you know, 
from a profit perspective. Like sometimes, hey, this this thing closes this door and it opens this crazy window that you never would have gone through. And that turns out to be the best thing that happens to you. I think it's important like when we say the obstacles away, obviously I wrote a book on this, but like, I'm not saying that everything is that, right? Because how does a cancer diagnosis become that? Or like the death of your father become that? Or a pandemic where millions of people die. Like shit happens that's just fucking terrible, right? That's life. And it's important that we're not dismissive of the profound pain and anguish that's a result of that. The Stoics would still say the opportunity, and I don't think they would use the word opportunity because it feels, again, insensitive, but they would say that still demands of you certain character traits. It's still an opportunity for what they would call arete or excellence. Like you still have to be a person inside that and you have to weather it, endure it, be of service to your fellow human beings. You know what I mean? So it's not, it's not always like a chance to just like make more money or, you know, build your brand. <laughs> like it's not always great for your career, mm -hmm. but it can always be, that's why I wrote during the pandemic, I wrote that note. I didn't say like, this is the chance for you to like, make a killing in real estate or like this is this is a chance for you to this is a chance for you to really take a lock on the independent bookstore market like i was looking out over this bookstore that was looking like it was going to be the biggest failure of my life and go it can make me a better person or a worse one right like it, it can also cost me my marriage it could also cost me my creative energy it could i could make it worse if i wanted to mm -hmm. i could also be improved by it right i could become more aware of my capacities. I could learn from the mistakes. My relationship could get better. My connection to human beings could get better. I could realize, hey, in the big scheme of things, none of this shit matters. You know, there's so many things you could take from it to emerge as a better person, mm -hmm. almost all of which are not related to money or success in really any way. I have a question about stoicism for you. All right. I figure, given where yes. we are, yes. this is the right venue. Okay. Of this is a big question. So if nothing comes to right. mind immediately, choose whatever floats to the surface. Of the all of the stoic writing mm -hmm. that you've digested, all of the stoic writing that you've done, all of the lessons and case studies that you've researched, there are certain things that people glom onto in a not negative way, positive way, but there's yeah. things that are, I would say, predominantly memorable, right? Yeah. This is true for my books as mm -hmm. well. There's certain things that people tend not to miss. Yes. Right? So like in the four hour work week, the, <laughs> funny enough, one of the things that people always remember is the guest chapter by AJ Jacobs about outsourcing his life with yeah. virtual assistants. But they tend to miss, and this is going to lead into my question, the filling the void chapter. Because they're like, oh, good problem to have. Ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll worry about that when I get there. And then people really fuck it up badly and can end up in existentially pretty diff difficult places. What are some of the things that are really valuable that you wish people paid more attention to? Ooh, that's a great question. By the way, I was I was sitting out in front of Newark Airport like maybe a year ago. Just smoking and, your corn cob pipe? <laughs> no, just sitting there and just not waiting inside the airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting there and like a car pulls up and AJ gets out with his whole family. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, what are the chances? And I go, what are you working on? He's like, oh, I'm pretending I lived during colonial times. Like he was spent, he spent a year of his life dressing like George Washington. And like, oh no, yeah, he was living living by the constitution. That's what he was yeah, doing. He has, was like he has the movie. most patient wife in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. the year of living biblically. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, also an amazing book. Side so note. good. He's amazing. Um, but uh, okay, so... I I wouldn't even fault the audience for this necessarily. I would fault myself. My initial read on, like we see what we wanna see when we're looking for stuff, right? Or we see what we need to see at that point in our life. And so my early takes on the stoicism, or on stoicism, I would say were primarily about what it could give me, right? How it can make me more resilient, how it can make me stronger, how it can make me, uh, smarter, you know, uh, how it can make me more successful. Like I took, I, I was looking at stoicism at, at, through what it's been for lots of people for thousands of years, which is a form of self-help, right? Um, and of course I understood that he's talking about virtue, he's talking about common good and all these things. But I would say it it wasn't until later that I understood. So the, the cardinal virtues of stoicism are 
courage, self-discipline, justice, and wisdom. But if you really think about it, the key virtue is justice because it renders, it decides whether any of the other ones were worthwhile or not, right? So like courage- I can't wait to hear this. Courage in pursuit uh, of the wrong thing mm -hmm. or a cruel and selfish Mm -hmm. or whatever thing, right? Courage in pursuit, like courage uh, or discipline or wisdom, like if it's not rooted towards like, making the world better or doing what the social called the right thing, right? Their, their understanding of justice isn't like the legal system. It's like, what kind of person are you and what kind of code or values do you have? I think I came later than I, than I, I, I came later to a, a more full understanding of what stoicism is asking of you mm-hmm. as opposed to what it can provide you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm just finishing this book now on Justice, which will be the third book in that series. So I've been thinking a lot about it more. But like, like almost all the Stokes were active in politics. Almost all the Stokes wrote books to share what they learned. Like there was this sense, the diff the fundamental difference between the Epicureans and the Stoics, Seneca says, is that an Epicurean basically withdraws from the stresses and complications of life into the garden where they have fun and enjoy themselves and hang out with their friends. And a Stoic is involved in the polis, like in public mm-hmm. life. And so I I feel like my writing has changed and evolved and my focus on that thing has changed and evolved more. So I, I can sometimes tell when a fan is upset with me because they're at an earlier place in the understanding of stoicism, which I once was, mm-hmm. and they're hearing from me now and they don't, get, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they it's hard want for to, them to sort of reconcile the two or yeah. or maybe just to take on both at the same time. It's like, they're like, I wanted you to give me advice on how I could be a better sociopath. You know what I mean? And you're <laughs> you're telling me that I'm not supposed to be a sociopath, right? And uh, and uh, I, I that that's the big one mm. to me. I mean, I think I, I've seen this in your work and I've always admired it. That's something I was going to ask you. You, from the beginning, like before your books were successful, you were donating like a percentage of the profits of the four hour work week to, yep. to you've always been like focused on not just capturing value for yourself, but I would describe you as a generous person. Thanks. Um, I appreciate that. And, and to me, that's like a really key stoic virtue, right? Mm-hmm. And, or it's that's part of that virtue of justice, but it, it's, um, talking about that feels kind of judgy or self righteous. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's easier yeah. to go like, seven stoic strategies to be more productive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is. And I think there's, I mean, I've seen this with some of my writing as well, because it tends to be prescriptive mm-hmm. nonfiction. And I think that one could make, to to speak in the defense of the people who are focused on improving themselves, that people, and then borrowing from Ariana Huffington, at least I've heard her say this, that you should put on your own, mask before helping others. You got to start there. Right. Totally. Like put on your own oxygen mask first. And at the same time, or not at the same time to, to just add something to the, the donation. So since the first book, you're right that a portion has been donated to different nonprofits or causes. Yeah. I mean, a lot of money at this point. And yeah, five percent of the royalties of the four hour work week is not a small amount of money. Yeah, it may have been t- it may be ten, it may be more than oh, 10. Oh yeah, it was ten. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been true for other books as well. Uh I've I've far exceeded that. But the point that I was gonna make is part of the reason I did that, and maybe this is a very stoic thing, <laughs> is you could say there are a few different motivations for that. One is to do the right thing yeah. and to help things that I think are worth helping. Not just to help them financially, but to draw attention to them sure. in ways that may exceed my own financial contribution. That's how I heard about Donors Choose. Yeah. Like it was because yeah. it was, it, you were saying, I'm not donating 10% of this to charity. You said a specific charity. It's very specific. And I said, what charity is that? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's one. The next is that I have just noticed as a pattern, and this could be false, uh, false causality, but it's correlation at least people who tithe in some way seem to be generally happier. Yeah. Now you could say, well, they're probably also in most cases highly religious, so couldn't it be caused by something else? It's like saying, well, people who do yoga are so much healthier and have better teeth. And you're like, yeah, but they also tend to be of a higher socioeconomic class so they can pay for better dental care, et cetera. So I understand the confounders here. 
But I will say that from a personal experience, so let's make this the, the third thing, is that if you give some amount of money away, it's almost like you've created a deliberate hole in the boat that is your finances. And what that does for me at least is it loosens my white knuckle grip on this thing called financial success yeah. because I've, all, I've created an automatic release valve where some of it is disappearing. And as a practice, I think that has... You're not so uh, precious with the resource. Yeah. Yeah. Like I am, I am assuming from the outset there is enough, there is a sufficiency not saying abundance necessarily, but there's there is a there is there's a sufficiency instead of a scarcity such that it, I can absolutely afford to give ten percent off the top to other things, and that that will be a net life quality multiplier, or at least positive for me, as opposed to negative. And certainly that's been my experience. Well, this is a chance we can test the theory of Aristotle. So Aristotle says virtue isn't this thing that you are right, that you were born as. He says virtue is like playing the flute or uh, building houses. You become a house builder by building houses. You become a flute player by playing the flute. And his point was like, you become a courageous person by doing brave things. And he says, you become generous by doing generous acts. Mm -hmm. So do you think generosity was something you learned? Was it like a skill that you acquired? Or do you think it was just naturally always what you were or it was easy? Like, do you feel like you've gotten better at it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've gotten better at it. And I'm also, uh, I try to be very surgical with it, mm. right? In the sense that I don't diminish automatically feel good, let's just say philanthropy. I hate yeah. that word. Let's call it um, cause giving. Yeah. The reason the reason I don't like philanthropy is because <laughs> it implies, right, like biophilia, like fill loving yeah anthropy right like anthropology loving humans yes and i don't actually i, I wouldn't say default love humans i think as, a, as, as as a species we're kind of a disaster yeah, yeah. and uh, invasive and very right. destructive is, you, is preserving the environment driven by your love of humans or is right. it actually so, the opposite so if i'm working on say with amazon conservation team which is one nonprofit i've vetted and feel very good about yeah. from a, like capital efficiency operation standpoint uh that has nothing to well, I shouldn't say it. It doesn't have nothing to do with humans, but yeah. it's also like preserving ecosystems. But where I was going with this is I've become better and better at investing in good vehicles for accomplishing things in a nonprofit capacity, just as I have in the for-profit investing sure. world. The way I look at them is really the same. I also do some feel-good stuff where it's very individual it is not attempting to scale yeah. which is sometimes important but more often this word that's thrown around and a somewhat casual way to justify all sorts of yeah uh so oftentimes greedy behavior on the part of rich people who don't want to donate money uh <laughs> like scrooge mcduck kind of stuff montgomery burns if you prefer and uh I, I do think that from a young age, and I turned this off for a long time, but like a very deep feeler, like a very sensitive kid. Yeah. So from a very young age, and I, I don't know if my parents encouraged this. Maybe I was just traumatized by like UNICEF commercials with the kids with like the flies in their eyeballs. Yeah. Uh, but from a very young age, and my family, I, I don't come from money, right? Like my family didn't have very much money. We had to make a lot of, uh, yeah, we, we can get into it, yeah. but... Like we did not have a lot of money, yeah. suffice to say. Uh, and I I gave, even when I was really young, and by young, I mean like, I don't know, six, seven, nine, like a part of my yeah. life. Like, wow. If I got like a little bit of allowance or something, I would give a little bit away. Yeah. Because it, it felt like the right thing to do. Uh, but then there was a large period of time where I didn't do any of that. And I was like, hey... You got to take care of number one first. Yeah, sure. Kind of Gordon Gecko. Let's yeah. let's let's solve this problem first, and then I can do good later. Yeah. And then for for a, a host of reasons, I started to question that logic, both for personal fulfillment and for impact. Right. Yeah. Like these. Sure, your net worth might be scaling, but is it scaling, inflation adjusted, at pace with the 
the problems that are also compounding? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. So sure. I think in a lot of cases, the answer is early intervention with less money is better than late intervention with more money. Sure. Certainly, if that's true in medicine, yeah. <laughs> it's very true with lots of the problems we see in the world or just causes that we want to further. So for me, <clears throat> I wrote this blog post, God, ages ago, back when I had hair. I mean, it was probably 2007 or eight. It's hard to believe that there are thousand plus blog yeah. posts. I mean, it's, I forget about that sometimes. That was an important bridge between yeah. the, bo the book and sure. other things that right. I sometimes forget about in terms of connective tissue. But I wrote this piece called the something like the karmic capitalist yeah. or principles of karmic capitalism, where I laid out some of my early thinking on this. Uh, so I took a long hiatus from that type of thinking and uh, have come back to it. But it is a practice. It is a practice. And uh, I, I found your comment on justice as sort of the, this isn't going to be the best phrasing, but the sort of master determinant of virtue or lack of virtue when yeah. you're, right, the sort of parent virtue above others, yeah. in a sense. Uh, I've been thinking quite a lot about uh, mother qualities, right? So mm -hmm. for instance... Like what is the rate limiter? Which is slightly different than what you were saying. But if you talk to like Pavel Tsatsoulin about physical fitness, so he popularized kettlebells in the United yeah. States and really knows his stuff. And for him, it's like strength first. Like yeah. strength, if you look at longevity, if you look at health span, if you look at your ability to execute other things. He's like, sure. before you worry about flexibility, before you worry about mobility, before you worry about endurance, strong first. That's the name of his company, in yeah. fact. And I was like, okay, that's very, it, it, even if it's inaccurate, I happen to think it's accurate. Yeah. It's helpful to sit and think about that for sure. a second and interrogate that concept. And uh, so to give you a window in, yeah. right? I do five, five Bullet Fridays yeah. newsletter every Friday. It goes out to a couple million people. And I capture things as I'm out mm -hmm. in the world that are going to later make it into Five Bullet Friday. Yeah. So as we're recording this, something that I'm working on are a few quotes that are compatible that all touch on the same thing, which is laying out a hierarchy of virtues. And they word it very eloquently. Yeah. Maya Angelou is one. And she talks about courage as yes. the mother virtue because right. all other virtues at their testing point. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that quote that it's all, I think there's a C.S. Lewis version of that same quote. It's, there are a you bunch. See it, that it's, it, and it's true. And I think I said this in the book I did on courage, that courage is the essential version because you can't do any of the other things without courage. And it's true. It's just it, it the absence of justice or the absence yeah, could, of it you, being yeah. the right thing immediately renders whatever it is yeah. worthless. If you win the Medal of Honor for the Confederacy, you yeah. know, it's like there's something hollow about it. Like there's a there's a Lord Byron quote where he says, "'Tis the cause makes all that hallows or degrades courage in its fall." Mm. Like what it is in pursuit of. Like there's so many lonely stands you could take. Those right? old timers love their rhymes. You got to start rhyming more. It, well, that's a poem. <laughs> so, but that was from a poem. But the point is, like there's a lot of lonely stands Doesn't you could take. Doesn't mean you can't do some stoic spoken word stuff anyway if, if you're if you're taking the lonely stand but it's wrong you know what i mean yeah, or it's yeah, inact yeah. like it, it's it's rendered worthless both of these are interesting i mean it, it's i'm glad that you brought up justice piece because now i can think about both of these side by side yeah right yeah and if you have a common failure mode right it's like if something dysregulates you mm -hmm. if there are certain issues that seem to repeat. If you have certain patterns with your significant other, it's like, okay. Right. Is this, and because justice can also be hijacked by the righteous mind. Of course. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so I, I, but I, but it helps to have a list, like a checklist to run through. Anyway, I just wanted to say it's, it's, uh, I, I'm really glad you brought it up because now I have a completely different lens on a list that I might have automatically ordered with courage at the top. Interesting. In a sense. I'll, I'll send you the book. It's, I just sent it into the publisher like three days ago. But you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna let people in on a on some inside baseball. So part of the reason it's done. Yeah. It's done. It's finished. It's finished. Hundred percent. Hundred percent done. Okay. All right. Then maybe I can take a look at it because 
And we've had this experience before. You've <laughs> you sent, sent me finished books with pages ripped out. You're like, delete this page, delete yeah, this page. Yeah. yeah, if I get sent a manuscript, part of the reason that I'm just like, I don't read manuscripts is because I cannot turn off editing. Yes. And so I will I will do a full book edit <laughs> that takes a, an absurd shit ton of time because I can't turn it off. And mm -hmm. I actually, I, I'm not gonna be an editor, but I think I'm a better editor than a writer. Uh, I'm I there's lower stakes when you're lower stakes, else. right? I'm just like, yeah, we should definitely take out the appendix. Yeah, no, you don't really need your left toe. We can take that off because I don't have to actually deal with the consequences. But that level of detachment, which I have with very few things, uh, I, I it's helpful, right? Like when I'm looking yeah. for editors, I try to embolden them to be willing to say, yeah, we should lose your left toe. Yeah, well, that I mean, you always you whenever you've sent me your stuff, you always say something like, "What what's your least favorite chapter? What chapter would you cut? Right? Where is it too if long? If you had you're, to cut a chapter, you're never like, "What do you like?" You know? No, I'm like, if you had to cut twenty percent, what would you cut? So, so to go back to generosity, the other thing I think I would point out because again, it can feel very sort of first worldly where it's like we associate generosity and money, mm -hmm. but of course, there's many ways to be generous, right? Like, can you be uh, just like I think. We talked about competition earlier. It's so easy to live in a world where you think things are zero sum, mm -hmm. right? And that if somebody else gets ahead, it means it's coming at your expense in some way. And I think even there, I've I've had to grow and I feel like I've changed, which is like, I now feel in some ways more excited when I help someone else succeed mm -hmm. uh, or if I open a door for someone mm -hmm. than I do with my, like with my own stuff, right? Like, and the idea of just, that that's, but that's a result of having helped people mm -hmm. and experienced how wonderful that felt, right? Do you know what I mean? Before yeah. you do it, it feels like stupid. We, we can also paint it in a very, uh, maybe helpful self-serving way, which yeah. is, let's put generosity aside for a second. Although it is one way to describe some of these behaviors. Yeah. If you, for instance, well, let me just put out an observation first, which is I think that generosity is inversely correlated to wealth in the first world as, as, a, as a percentage of what you possess. I actually believe that from what I've seen, like the more money people have, the better they are at the money accumulating game, the less they want to part with it. Sure. And... That's probably how they accumulated in the first place. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, look, I'm, I'm sure I'm guilty of that on some level. Yeah. Right. Like you have to value money to yeah. accumulate a bunch of it unless sure. you're just, okay, fine. Like you got yeah. drunk and bought, bought the Powerball and, <laughs> yeah. and there yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah. You have a few hundred million. Sure. That doesn't usually last very long. Right. If that's the case. But I'll put it this way. If you, and this is something we've been talking about a little bit earlier directly, but mostly indirectly, and that is if you go into Starbucks tomorrow and you buy, you're paying for your coffee and you give the barista 20 bucks and you're like, I'm paying for the person or two behind me. Yeah. That act implicitly says, I have more than enough. Yeah. That is a very uncommon perception of reality in, say, the United States, yeah, in a go go go, sure, accumulate capitalist society, yeah. It it's it is just I think very uncommon. Like I have more than enough. Yeah, that sure. is what that act says. I have extra. I have extra. Not only do I have what I need, I have extra. Is what that says. Yeah. Can you afford? Forget about twenty bucks. Can you give like five bucks yeah. and say like, hey, whoever comes in under five bucks, yeah. If you can afford to go to Starbucks to buy your venti yeah. frappuccino with. Yeah. God knows what diabetes fuel in it. Then your breakfast milkshake. Yeah, if your breakfast milkshake, you can probably afford to pay for someone's like sure. next sure. small black coffee. And that is a non-trivial act. Yeah, as a sort of statement of self-appraisal. Yeah, it sounds silly, but it's no, like but you're try reinforcing it. it to yeah. your, the, actually, the beneficiary of that is you. Yeah, yeah. Because try you it. are like, try it tomorrow. You, yeah. you are, you are not just saying that you have enough. You are acting as if you have enough, like as they say act as if you are acting as if you have enough yeah and then it becomes truer to you at a more like cellular level mm -hmm. and then so when yeah you hear about some natural disaster or somebody your employee asks for your raise or something you can go like i don't need to approach this from a scarcity mindset which is the default setting i think of the human species i mean we 
come from a place where there was never enough food, yeah. right? Their survival was, <clears throat> we were always teetering on the edge of survival. And then depending on where you come, like more recently, you know, your grandparents grew up in the depression or you grew up as an immigrant in a poor country, like depending on what that is, it's even compounding the, just the biological urge of like, never enough, save some store, winter is coming, right? Yeah, and you're, yeah, yeah. so you're practicing and teaching yourself, you're developing the virtue as Aristotle says, by doing the thing. Yeah, and like and and practicing gripping it lightly, right? And, yeah. and by the way, that small act of paying for somebody behind you, as an easy example, yeah, like that transcends money, yeah, right. Uh, which is why I think, uh, well, I tend to do better in crisis than I do with like the small paper cuts in life. Yeah, yeah, me too. So my like my work to do <laughs> is with the little annoyances, mm -hmm. often, very often human factors. Yeah. <laughs> this is where justice gets me in trouble. <laughs> it's just the principle of the thing. You know, that's, yeah. oh boy, now Tim's about to really punish himself. Uh, and <laughs> but the to the extent that I've made progress on the crisis side and to the extent that I've made progress on the paper cut side, I think it's through these little things. Yeah. And those things compound and they become a habit. Well, it's important, you know. And it's a habit of thinking, by the way. Yes. it's The habit of action leads to a habit of thinking. And vice versa. And vice versa. You can probably give me the attribution. You're so much better at this than I am. But like, it's easier to act your way into, into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. This would be an example, I, I think, potentially have that. They're not mutually exclusive, but that would be that would be an example. It, it, it's funny, right? The obstacle is the way, which is from this quote from Marcus Aurelius. He does talk a lot in meditations about how like difficult circumstances, obstacles are fueled, whatever. But specifically that quote, I truncated, like I shortened it. I didn't include some of the beginning and I cut out some of the middle. But that fuller quote is about annoying, obnoxious people. It's about, he says, it's about the people who obstruct us, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, he opens meditations with, he he was clearly perpetually annoyed with human beings. And mm -hmm. he would have had to interact with lots of them, probably many of the worst of them, right, as his job. What was what was, what was his line that was like, when you leave the house today, expect yes. that you will find people ungrateful, rude, entitled, these guys just That's the, the opening of meditations, yeah, there right? You go. Like that, that <laughs> yeah. is, for, he, he he to his credit the first book is all about gratitude but then when he gets to the actual book and itself like, but it's i like, still have a few things to say about but, really but everyone annoying else people sucks like yeah. these 20 people who help me are awesome but everyone else fucking sucks but even the rest of that quote you know he goes like we're made to work with each other he's like these people don't know what they're doing he's like he's like uh he's like they can't implicate me in ugliness and he's like my job is to put up with them and work with them like it, it's funny like the famous part is like how shitty everyone is. That's what everyone remembers. But he catches himself halfway through that paragraph yeah. and it ends on a very positive note to be patient and generous and collaborative, you know? So it, it's funny, like we see what we, we see the confirmation of like, yeah, people are that way. But what we kind of conveniently ignore is what he's saying we have to do with those people, which is be good to them. I have a uh, top secret stoic life hack. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> giving some wording for the yeah. thumbnail. <laughs> and this is borrowed from a friend of mine. I'm not going to name him because the way that he phrased it was would actually be much more offensive, but <laughs> he he he's been he, I've observed a a visible difference in his state of ease in the world. And I was like, "What's going on?" Yeah. He's like, "Oh, basically I've just decided when I go out in the world that I'm going to treat everyone as if they have a debilitating disease that affects their like mental and emotional regulation yeah and it just makes it so much easier to deal with everybody it's like you're not gonna get angry at somebody if they're handicapped yeah right like how insensitive would that be yeah so when you go out it's just <laughs> there you go folks the philosophical way i've heard that expressed <laughs> is act as if no one else has free will mm. and only you do <laughs> which is which is like they are be they are they are programmed there's some person pulling puppet strings making them do all the things that are bothering you frustrating so they're utterly blameless and yeah. can't be held responsible for their decisions and actions yeah. except for you you mm -hmm. you do own what you do mm -hmm. and and there is something about that 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 I think I think there's a there's an element of truth to that or it's like um you know 
act act as if Adam Smith said, uh, you know, again, we think of Adam Smith as this like ruthless practitioner or, or philosopher of capitalism, but he also writes a book called A Theory of Moral Sentiments about like how we should be good people. But he basically says like, act as if there's an impartial observer following you everywhere, just going, mm -hmm. hmm. You know, like to everything that you do, like a little hall monitor with a yeah, exactly <laughs> clipboard. Just, just like, could you justify it to that person? You know, and a lot of times, like they're not God or anything. He's just saying, like they're just watching. Like how how much would you do? How much differently would you act if other people were watching? And mm -hmm. and it it does kind of I think keep you honest. You would you you tip a little more. <laughs> you'd you'd be a little bit more patient. You know, you do all the things that you want to do but you think you can get away with not doing. Here's another lead domino, let's call it, just to get fancy, yeah. that if tipped over, tips over a lot of other things. And I'll, I will likely be doing this in the next year, probably in the next quarter. And it's so straightforward. And I haven't tracked the author, so I don't know if they've been embroiled in scandal or something. There's, there's no reason for me to expect that, but like just in case, because I don't want Yeah, I mean, you talked about Scott Adams earlier. Can yeah, people just like not... Yeah be awful so I can yeah. <laughs> use your work, which I like. Yeah, just just for, for this snapshot yeah. in time. But I think it was Will Bowen, might be the pronunciation, B-O-W-E-N. In any case, it's the 30-day no complaint experiment. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think this is the first blog post you ever wrote. It was wrote. a very early blog post. Yes. And if you want to change your life, you put a bracelet on, could be a rubber band, and every time you complain, you switch to the other wrist. It might be 21 days, but it's yeah. three or four weeks. And... If you make a concerted effort to not complain at all for, and you achieve a solid, let's call it even two weeks yeah. without switching that bracelet, your quality of life will change completely. Uh, if, if you have some improvement, let's just say, yeah. that can be gained, which I would say is true for most people. And it, it's a forcing function for a lot of the stoic practices. It should be a rubber band and then instead of switching, you just have that. <laughs> I wonder, yeah, you know, I, I suppose you could do it a whole bunch of ways. You could get like an Opus Day, yeah. Cat of Nine Tails. <laughs> Might be a little awkward in said Starbucks if suddenly you bitch. It's well, Samantha, <laughs> Samantha and I found that. So like, obviously we work together and so, but we're not always together. So we would like get home in the afternoon or the evening and we'd be like talking about like work stuff, right? And we realized like our kids thought we were fighting <laughs> because like we weren't mad at each other, but we were both complaining slash venting about stuff, yeah. right? And if you're a kid, you don't really understand what's happening. You're like, why is dad talking negatively to mom? And why is mom talking negatively to dad? It, none of the animus or the frustration was directed at each other, yeah. but it, it's the person we were communicating it to. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, we realized <clears throat> one, we just shouldn't, like first off, it's like okay, let's not talk about work around the kids if that's how we're going to do it. And then second, it was like this shouldn't be the f everything's going great. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like at at the end of the day, we're actually quite happy with everything, but we're just like picking the end. Of, we're picking to end the day by like ruminating on and complaining about all the things we don't like. Right? Mm -hmm. We're not setting aside and going this happened well and this happened well and what about this? We're we're just using our limited time together. Mm -hmm to fucking <laughs> hurl garbage at each other. Yeah, exactly. Which is a very, it's a very human thing. Of course. Right? It's a super human thing. And I'll give just one tip if people yeah. pursue this exercise. Read the blog post because I, I thought about it much more completely when I wrote that, uh, the no complaint experiment, my name, it'll pop right up. And the book is great. I really, really found the book incredibly helpful. What is a complaint? It becomes important to define this before you embark on this experiment. You need to have some, some yeah. rules of play. And I would say one of the critical, one of the critical details that I at least implemented in my life, because there are going to be times when you have to discuss something that is negative, that yeah. sucks, that is just bad, yeah. that is a problem. But how do you prevent that from being categorized as a complaint you talk about what you're going to do about I'm it i'm not complaining but yeah that, you that's you, you, yeah, you, yeah that doesn't work that's <laughs> that's that's yellow card <laughs> switch your band <laughs> uh you talk about what you're going to do about it yeah right right and you talk about like next actions who's going to own it how you're going to prevent it in the future if you don't if you don't have that addendum it is complaint 
do not pass go restart. Well, I, I'm glad you said that because like sometimes I'll talk about like, you know, the Stoics were, were tried to be dispassionate. They tried not to complain. You know, they tried not to lament. They tried not to be angry. And people go, why did you tell that to the civil rights movement or something? You know, like, like the, there's, <laughs> they weren't, <laughs> Martin Luther King wasn't complaining, right? Like protesting an injustice and then activating a large group of people for a, a redress of those grievances. It's not passive. Is, is, <laughs> that's not a complaint, right? Yeah. He wasn't like tweeting like, this sucks, it's not fair, right? Like he, <laughs> he it was so much more profound than that. So there's a difference between, um, objecting to something or trying to change something and then complaining about it. And that's really, the Stoics are, are and, and the complaint challenge, it's really about the imp, it, reveling in your yeah. impotence is the problem. You know what I'm saying? It's <laughs> the title of my next book. <laughs> <laughs> Middle, the, a middle-aged man's guide to life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, a the, it is, and it's important that we see the Stoics as people who led social movements, people who ran for office, people who you know, you've little like acronyms for yeah. books because yeah. the title's long. So, you could, this one could be RIP, <laughs> RIYP, <laughs> but you could shorten it. You can get fancy with some old timey capitalization, make it a little pseudo German, anyway. But so. you know what I mean? Like, there's a, there's a difference between doing something about a problem and just you know, lamenting a problem. Right. And this, so this no complaint experiment with the qualifier that I just mentioned yes. will force you to think very carefully about what, about what is in your control and what is not. Because yes. if it's out of your control and you start to talk about it and it's negative, guess what? You're fucked. Now you have to switch your band and start over. Yes. So it's, it's a, it is very much a forcing function. The other, th the other pro tip I'll give, if you're going to try this, Delete Twitter from your phone. <laughs> I would just, whatever you're doing right now, just delete Twitter from your phone. Like yeah, the, the, yeah. you just said quality of life yeah. improver right there. It doesn't matter what, what your resolution is for the year. Just start by doing that because it's not improving your life in any way. And by the way, it wasn't improving your life like a year ago. And now it's like a thousand times worse and more toxic. So it's just not good for you as a person. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, that's if you, yeah, if you want to control your outputs, control your inputs. Totally. Um, be very careful about what you put into your mind. And if you want to see what it can do to you, just see what it's cost to the richest man in the world. Yeah. Like it's not good for your soul. It's not good for your reputation. It's not good for your mind. I, I would say too, like on the complaining thing, one of the, one of the things I try to work on is like, like if you run a company or business, it's not quite complaining, but it's close to like, you kind of have to have a policy or you have to communicate inside your culture. Like don't come to me with problems. Right. Because that's also a form of complaint. Like this is wrong. It's like, okay, but you should have sat with it for five more minutes and come to me with what we're going to do about it. Because otherwise, like imagine, a, imagine, especially a big company, like imagine someone has a thousand employees, the thousand employees come to one person with their problem. That person is just going to kill themselves. Yeah. Or if they come to multiple people, it just becomes this game of problem hot potato. Yes. And that's a huge waste of everyone's resources. Yeah. What are you going to do about the problem? What What is the problem presenting us as far as options? And they might all be bad options, but you can't, it, it can't just be like, here's negative information. Yeah. Do with it what you will. Yeah. I have a Google document that is like, the commandments of sort of TFE, which is yeah. like Tim Ferriss Enterprises, right? Which is not the real name of my company, but it's just easy shorthand. And one of them is at the very top is if there is a problem come to, and it needs to be discussed, you need to have, you need to have at least two options that are ranked order. Yeah. And you can explain why you've chosen your top option. What are the other commandments? Or what are some of them? Some of them relate to uh, tactical, basic procedural things like calendaring, right? So this is going to be- Put it in, like, it doesn't exist if it's not in the calendar? It, yes, but it's more specific. So for mm -hmm. instance, this is going to be very in the weeds, but people might find it helpful. So if someone or if I offer, say, make this up, uh, reviewing annual blood work with a doctor's office yeah. and you send them two times for a potential call. Yeah. They might take a few days to get back to you. Yeah, yeah. 
But if you live in a world where a lot has a lot is scheduled constantly, you need to block out those potential times. Yes. And in the entry and say Google Calendar, I would put, have people Tentative. put a question mark at the beginning of the entry. Yeah. That just means it hasn't been confirmed. Mm. It's blocked, but it hasn't been confirmed. And if there is not a very <laughs> unbend, if there's if there's not an immutable policy for doing that, things are going to get double booked. Things are going to get lost, yes. and it's going to get very messy. And then you just create a lot of work. You create more work for more people. Yeah. So there would be, say, a commandment of that. There's actually a separate Google Doc which is just calendar rules. Yeah, like tactical. This is how I like calendar to be rules. Done. Uh, but what are more? What are some general, like, like philosophical commandments then? Let me think about this because I I know that we have like two or three pages, but it's been a long time since I've been in that document. I have two. If you Let's hear yours. Yeah, um, buy me some time. I, I wrote down because I'm going to do a whole list. But uh, my my two they they seem related, but they're separate. So one, there's a sign in the kitchen at per se that just says a sense of urgency. Yeah, I've which seen, I love. I've seen it. It was and, in the four hour chef. Yeah, uh, and so like. That you have to do things quickly, and and related to that, my other rule is start the clock. So like, um, let's say it it's going to take someone else like at a different like to get back to us or process something or manufacture. Something. It's going to take a month, right? So if we take two weeks dicking around thinking about it, it actually takes six weeks, yeah. right? Like part of it we control is when we start the clock, like when we hit the ball back into their court and it's their problem. So I, I I am continually frustrated with and appalled by the waste of like, okay, if we like we have a bunch in there because we're doing it for Christmas, bunch of signed books. If we don't get the books packaged and signed by Saturday at 9.30 a.m. because the shipping deadline is 10 a.m. for the post office here, mm -hmm. then we might as well not fucking do it until Monday at four, which is the next shipping deadline, right? Mm -hmm. So we got to start, like we're adding two days to that clock by not starting it here, right? And so I find myself repeating a lot, like start the clock. Don't, if if something, if a video editor has to work on something, um, we want them to have as much time as possible. So start the clock by giving mm -hmm. them the materials, the outline, all the things they need to start the clock. So that's yeah. one of my big things is just, and that's how I think about life is like, I don't procrastinate. I start the clock. A book's going to take a year. I don't spend, you know, a bunch of time wondering if I'm going to do it, when I'm going to do it. I start the clock. Mm -hmm. Well, what's your current, when do you write typically now? Just the like mornings, your, like morning. nine, uh, like, sorry, like 8.45, depends on school drop off, but let's say 8.45. If I'm still writing by noon, that's like a long day of writing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like, it's a very short, concentrated windows. And if you do it day in and day out, it adds up. Mm -hmm. So, but, so if you start the clock, it adds up. If you don't start the clock, it hasn't started adding up. So uh, I, I have a, a commandment that relates to starting the clock. And it really just relates to making faster decisions. Mm. When you have, and which is very often the case, incomplete information or information yeah. that might change. Yeah. It's like if, if, you, if it's reversible or if it's an acceptable cost, yeah. i.e. acceptable loss, just book multiple things, right? If you think if oh. you if you think I might fly at this time and this time, but it's going to take like a week or two, yeah. Don't try to hold that in your head. Yeah, just book both, and then you can at, cancel one and pay the fee. Yeah, 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 exactly. Just, just, just. Sure. If it can be reversed or canceled at minimal cost, in some cases, it's at full cost. I'm willing to bear the brunt of that. Sure. In other cases, it's free, and Which it was just, it was a dichotomy in your head that you couldn't. Do both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, then uh, I, I want people to move quickly, in part because working memory is so faulty. Yeah, and even documentation can be very clumsy, right? With like a million Google Docs scattered all over the place, or notes, and people lose track of things. I mean, we do have basic infrastructure and tools that we rely upon, like Asana and so on. But that would be another one. Uh, effectively, setting rules for people to make faster decisions and explaining what types of decisions would fall into that category yeah. is one. I have one, it's uh, you better have a reason. And so uh, what, by, by that, I mean like, like let's say I see someone, they, they made an editorial decision or they made a content decision or they made a business decision or whatever. And I disagree. And that's just a fact of life. Like you can't preemptively weigh in on every decision. The whole point of life is you have to delegate decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And so people on your team make decisions. and. 
I accept that I'm going to disagree with a lot of those decisions. Where I get upset or where I uh, will come to not be able to work with a person is when I go, okay, so you sent this out at this time or you did it this way. And I go, why? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Or, you know, like, it's just how it came or whatever, right? And if they're, if the decision, even if it's really bad, even if it costs a lot of money, even if I totally disagree, even got a lot of people upset, if they're going, well, what I was thinking was, and then they have logic behind what they did, mm -hmm. then we can have a conversation and be like, okay, I, I, I totally see that. Here's why I disagree. Here's how I want it to go forward. But what you can't do if you're making decisions that ultimately reach lots of people as like a media company does is just unthinkingly do shit, right? And so one of mine is like, I'll respect your reason. I may disagree and I may correct that reason and I may override that reason going forward, but you have to have a reason for the decisions that you make, which mm -hmm. you'd think it would be, everyone would always have a reason for why they do things, but <laughs> welcome to life, they mm -hmm. don't. Yeah, yeah, totally. There's a, there, there are a bunch. I mean, th this is another procedural one, but it saves a lot of time, which is with rare exception, because there are exceptions, uh, but with rare exception, if someone requests a meeting with me yeah. or a call, number one, no. For for me, Zoom, <laughs> it, well, yeah. Number one, Zoom has introduced more problems than it has solved for of me. Of course, like phone calls on a cell phone are great. Yeah, I can walk. I can be driving. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I do not need to be sitting in my uncomfortable chair staring at a screen any longer than is necessary. So, so there's a hierarchy in terms of what I yeah. will and won't do. But in addition to that, if someone requests a call, the first thing is generally as a response will be. Tim would love to do this. He's currently heads down on some deadlines. Could you please just shoot over a couple of topics or questions to get the ball rolling via yeah. email? Yeah. And then if that leads, after I've reviewed that probably on a one-on-one -on -one call with said employee, if that has been raised to my attention and there are criteria for that, then if we book a call, almost always it's going to be 30 minutes. Yeah. What's and the smallest? Do you have like a, a, a maximum or a, like a normal unit of time, right? Like, so I think people are too casual with hours, right? It's like, yeah. hey, I'd like to meet. And they go, okay. And then they set it in the calendar for an hour. And you've yeah. just said it's going to take an hour. Yeah. I mean, if someone has requested a meeting with you, which is what I deal with more yeah. than the opposite, if you do, if you have a 30 minute block, there's a good chance they can go to 45 yeah. if need be. But block it out on 30. I prefer calls that are used for decision making, not problem defining. Yes. So uh, pretty much always an agenda, even if it's just a few bullets, will be requested because Tim likes to be as prepared as possible. Something like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, these seem basic, but man, do these little things add up over time. Yeah. And very small repetitive tasks done inefficiently can cripple you as an individual contributor, contributor, especially if you are trying to block out extended periods of time to do things. Yeah. So another yellow slash red flag would be, and this is not verbatim what's in the document, but let's just say that three things come up in a given week in a similar category, like of a similar type that need to be turned around that week. Yeah. That were not predicted. A system is broken. Like there needs mm. to be a process fixed. Sure. There, that, that, that pattern of related fires. Yeah. That, that urgency. Solve it further upstream. Should be solved further upstream. <clears throat> that then comes to, and I mean, it, it might seem strange. Hopefully it doesn't seem strange, but like a lot of the stuff in the four hour work week, I still lean extremely yeah. heavily on and the basic framework I would modify a little bit, although the acronym you'll see in a second is is a little less appealing. But in the, in the four-hour work week, you have, you have D-E-A-L, right? Oh, how clever. Yeah. Deal. That works. Okay. Definition, elimination, automation, liberation. In this case, I would say it's definition, elimination, automation, delegation. Unfortunately, that spells yeah. dead. But the idea is you need to be very clear if you're going to be trying to determine, say with 80-20 analysis, which I still use all the time, yeah. Pareto's Law, to identify the few inputs that produce the disproportionately large outputs. Yeah. 
you kind of need to know what targets you're aiming for. Yes. You really need to know. And that's definition. And there's a lot more to definition. Being very clear. If you're not clear on what you want, the ch- the likelihood of the universe delivering that to your doorstep with a bow on top is very low. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I've said before, and I, I remind myself of this a lot, that, you know, the world rewards the specific ask and punishes the vague wish. And definition then is step one. Then you have elimination, which is like, what what <laughs> what what golden fetters or less than golden fetters do you have that are hindering you from efficiently trying to reach those objectives yeah. or address those those things that you have defined what are the activities right the if we're doing an 80 20 analysis right the 20% that produce the 80 well that means hypothetically you have 80% of that pie chart left that you should yeah. trim yeah Okay, elimination, getting rid of as much as possible. Because a lot of people skip that step. And this we, we're seeing it right now on steroids with ChatGPT, like people doing a lot of meaningless bullshit very quickly. Yeah. And like doing something quickly or efficiently does not make it important. Yeah. So eliminating as much as possible, especially if you're going to have a very lean team, which I would suggest anyone should aim for, even if you have a thousand employees. Yeah. Right. So definition, elimination, automation. So this would be using technology. How do you do it more than, so you'll do it once and you get. Yeah. Setting a, setting a system or a policy, right. which could be very simple, by the way, it could be having a, 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 a virtual assistant or an assistant or an employee, or maybe yourself where you have a recurring calendar reminder to do this thing so that it doesn't pop up in the middle of your week unexpectedly. Oh shit. Property taxes are behind. Oh, wait a second. Some guy showed up at the farm saying that I'm <laughs> whatever. Yeah, if you're yeah. sitting down and writing out your mortgage check each month, you fucked yeah. up. It yeah. should be automated. Right, right, right. like yeah. that's something that can be automated. Uh, so a- automation can be a something that is implemented manually. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Like a, I have a reminder every morning, yeah. which is like so do, these, do these three low back exercises, so I don't need to think about it. You're automating the willpower and the the the, the contemplation. Right. So then there's the automation, and automation also. By the way, I was looking at some of the tasks that I've assigned to assistants in the past. We don't need to get derailed here, but. I track a lot of the AI developments pretty closely, and I do experiment with these tools. And I took the language that we had put in several Asana tasks for people to manually do. Yeah. And I looked at their response. Then we loaded the exact, more or less, like 95% identical language from that Asana yeah. task into ChatGPT to see what the output would look like. Yeah. And it was like 90% there. Wow. And it was instantaneous. Yeah. No comms cool. overhead. Wow. And there are drawbacks. Sure. I'm not, we don't have to get into them right now, but the technology is evolving so quickly. As soon as that stuff is really easily, elegantly, seamlessly integrated with OpenTable, integrated with Kayak or yeah. directly with airlines or the systems underlying reservation systems right. with, say, concierge services have access to it. So they don't need to, yeah. they're, they're, they're not calling all the airlines individually to right. negotiate on your behalf. Once those integrations are there, I really feel like two of the places that are going to be massively disrupted and suffer economically from AI are, and there will be benefits, but will be as two examples, India and the Philippines, call centers, yeah. virtual assistants. It's going to be, it's going to be very challenging, but that's an example of some degree of leveraging technology yeah. and reducing interpersonal overhead. Sure. And then at the very end, you have delegation. Yeah. Right. Yep. And uh, that process is something that I try to instill also in my employees, in yes. my team. Like, think these through in this order. Yeah, you don't need to be doing everything. Just everything needs to get done. Yeah, so that's your attitude towards them, and that should be their attitude towards tools, systems. Yeah, and if you're if vendors. you're thinking about if you're if you're doing a lot of stuff, because I am not going to keep an eye on all the yeah. balls that are being juggled. If there are certain things that are being repeated, come to me with a suggestion. Yeah for a systems I don't improvement. want life to set. Yeah. So <laughs> we've made a bunch of systems improvements in the last six months, and I think we will continue to do that. The most neglected step in all of that is elimination for a lot of reasons. 
Well, I would say the most neglected step- Actually, to, maybe at the top of the funnel. To, yeah, to me, and people miss it about the four-hour work week and why it's such an important book and why I do think it's relationship to stoicism is so important. The, the subtitle of that book about lifestyle design, right? Like, what do you want your life to look like? Because maybe, I mean, maybe for some people, they do like to do that stuff. But if you don't think about Seneca's thing is like, if you don't know where you're sailing, no wind is favorable. Mm. If you don't know what you want your life to look like, then you can't do any of that stuff. Like for me, like like I've said this, I just hired a new assistant and I was like, look, my ideal day is there's nothing in this calendar. Mm -hmm. Not like I'm not working. If there's nothing in the calendar, then I'm working all day on things I actually yeah. like doing. I'm living my life. And, and so I now know from experience, I don't like meetings, I don't like phone calls, I don't like things that take me away from what I like doing, right? And, and that's family and work. And so you've got to start with like, what do you want your life to look at what what are you trying to design for? What are you optimizing for? Mm -hmm. And then there's all these great frameworks for being optimized. But you got to know what's yeah. and a great aimed at a great for a great forcing function for systems. If you're if you don't have a lot of practice, talking about practices, yeah. right? If you're trying to sort of change your mode of thinking, your way of pattern recognition, your way of problem solving by acting first, consider doing mini retirement. Yeah. Like, and that's minimum three, ideally like four weeks off the grid or, which doesn't mean you have to be on like in a, can, in a canoe on the Amazon. It just, just take everything away. Yeah. It just means you are not allowed to fight any fires. Yes. If you just go on a one week vacation or even a two week vacation, you can let things turn into a blaze and come back and try to fix it. Three yeah. or four weeks, very difficult. So typically that will force you to put in place policies, rules, yeah. systems, and... <clears throat> ongoing types of delegation that will then persist past the point that you return. That's yeah. the whole intention. So that, that would be another recommendation for folks. If they seem to do a lot of ad hoc things, they're yeah. very busy and they suspect maybe these things could be eliminated. Maybe these things could be systematized, but they never seem to have the time to do it because they're just caught up in the day to day. And yeah. I end up there too, by the way, then look out over the next six months, or year plan a mini retirement that will force a lot of things to happen. Yeah, we spent a month in LA this year. And so we had a pet sitter like while we were gone at the house. And then it was amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Cause so, I mean, no, no one died, everything got taken care of. And we were like, oh wait, you could have this while you're home too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And you could just have the fun part, right? Yeah. And and yeah. So, so you gotta step away and come up with something that operates while you're away. And then you can go, okay, what part of this structure or infrastructure am I keeping? Mm -hmm. Because what's the point of the success if you're a miserable mess all the time? <laughs> right, yeah. Dude, this is amazing. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, super fun. Thanks very much.